Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the legislative hearings for the uh, 2021 convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first, know that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, it's The video is not going to be posted anywhere. We're uh, mainly uh, recording it because uh, Zoom will automatically produce a transcript for us, uh, which will make preparing uh, the convention journal easier. Uh, but just uh, be aware uh, that uh, your words are being recorded for posterity. Uh, the other item, of course, is um, we are all familiar with the muting issues on Zoom right now. Uh, I have muted you all, but since we're a small group today, uh, you are permitted to uh, unmute yourselves to ask questions uh, as we as we go through. Uh, just going to drop in the chat what our agenda is for uh, this morning. So we will start off uh, with prayer, uh, then a little bit more housekeeping regarding convention itself. Uh, then uh, Father Benjamin Wyatt, who is chair of the Resolutions Committee, uh, will walk us through uh, the resolutions that are coming to convention. Uh, I'll address the canon amendment, uh, and then Father C. Davies Reed uh, will discuss uh, the budget. And uh, I expect we will be done in an hour or uh, quite a bit less. Uh, but first, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be, be present with those who take counsel for the Diocese of Indianapolis, for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right, and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, so, Regarding uh, housekeeping items for convention, there are just a couple of items uh, I'd like to draw your attention to. First, uh, I am just dropping a link to the convention website in the chat uh, in case you don't have it readily at hand. I would ask you to review in advance, if you can, the, um, the rules of order uh, for 2021. Uh, they've been adapted slightly from what we did in 2020, uh, but we are trying to adopt, uh, adapt to a somewhat more complex uh, operating environment where we expect people to be participating both in person and online. Uh, so we do have additional rules, um, uh, additional rules uh, that are um, that are intended to deal with that. The most important of those has to do, I think, with how people will be recognized who wish to address convention. Uh, we are going to be making best efforts to recognize people in the order in which they make their desire to be recognized known, whether in person or online. The practical effect of that is that you might be standing at a mic uh, in person and not be able to see that there are people on Zoom in line ahead of you. Uh, so just be aware uh, that that is a thing that can happen and um, uh, and will um, and just be aware of it. Uh, the other thing is a reminder that proof of vaccination uh, is uh, is required. Uh, you don't have to bring your physical card with you, a, uh, a photo of your card or something like the My Bindle app that many of you may be familiar with uh, will suffice. Um, and uh, if you happen to forget your proof of vaccination, we will have some rapid COVID tests available. Um, we do hope you'll be able to join us for a social event on Friday evening uh, at six o'clock. There will be uh, heavy hors d'oeuvres um, and, um, and it will be largely outside, weather permitting, uh, so we hope uh, to see you then. And then last, uh, I know a question uh, in the chat about whether nominations are available for review. Uh, we'll have those up uh, no later than Tuesday. Uh, and the um, we do still have a couple of offices uh, where um, we would really like some nominees. Uh, so for disciplinary board, we need both a clergy uh, and uh, and lay person. Uh, everybody else, we've got at least one candidate running. But of course, um, it's always good to have competitive elections because it's a sign that people want to be engaged in leadership. We will accept nominations from the floor up to uh, nine o'clock on Saturday morning. All right. With that, um, I'm going to share my screen to get us started with the resolutions. And um, Ben, I will ask you to uh, MC us through this part. 
It's a pleasure. If I can find where I'm supposed to be. This is weird. There we go. All right. So we're starting with a resolution from uh, Church of the Nativity relating to uh, the Episcopal Church's role in Native American residential schools. And I recognize Rocky Patrick to speak to this resolution. Might help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, actually um, to speak to this a little bit, um, whenever, whenever learning about um, the uh, uh, residential schools, and learning about um, what was going on up in Canada with um, over the summer of the discovery of the mass graves. Um, I did a little bit more research and found out about the Episcopal Church's role in um, residential schools in the uh, United States. Um, I had found that in uh, Canada, the Anglican Church of Canada had actually already done work um, uh, in researching and providing uh, healing and education and working with the indigenous of Canada uh, with the residential schools that they were involved with. So um, I was, you know, uh, wanting to do, you know, help in some way in, uh, you know, moving forward with the Episcopal Church um, uh, doing similar work in the U.S. Um, so that was kind of um, the call to action for this um, uh, this resolution. However, um, uh, also in kind of that same time frame, uh, uh, Bishop Curry and um, the president of the House of Deputies, Gay Clark, had um, have made a statement on indigenous boarding schools, and actually they have um, they just a small excerpt from that. They called upon the Executive Council to deliver um, a, pr a proposal for addressing the leg legacy of Indigenous schools at the 80th General Convention, including earmarking uh, resources for independent research in the archives of the Episcopal Church, and then developing culturally appropriate lit liturgical materials and plans for educating Episcopalians across the church about the history, among other initiatives. So in reviewing all of that, in, in preparation for this, um, I came uh, to the thought that maybe at this time, um, I would uh, request to, um, uh, <laughs> I can't think of the word now, uh, withdraw. With, withdraw this resolution um, because the fact that there has been a call for the general convention to do um, this work um, not knowing what it's going to be yet, and then, um, you know, seemed a little bit um, maybe either premature or redundant in the fact that that um, call has been uh, made. And, you know, maybe upon seeing what that, what comes out of that, um, either, you know, affirming that, uh, you know, we'll do our part in that or, um, uh, you know, Call for maybe uh, additional uh, work, but um, so that was kind of where I was at with things right now. So, thank you, Rocky. Um, I believe now it's appropriate to move into any questions or discussion. Um, I'll just remind us all that you know this is it's important to be able to talk about these things fully, and no resolutions feelings are going to be hurt if the discussion is short. Um, but I do see Mary Slinsky, you've got your hand raised. So would you like to speak? I do, thank you, Ben. Uh, one is I understand you're suggesting that it not go forward to the diocesan convention, is that correct? 
Yes, yes. And, and I would suggest that we do keep it moving forward, even though Executive Council of the Episcopal Church and I would expect General Convention are going to resolve to this work. My experience has been that sometimes those resolutions that happen at General Convention, I uh, have particular experience with the resolutions on uh, use of alcohol, um, they get lost. And to specifically ask the convention as a diocese, our own convention, as a diocese to look at what complicity we may have had with the relocation of Native Americans, that's a good thing. And it puts it even closer in front of our congregation. So I, I would be in favor of it moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Are there any further questions, comments, points of clarification? Patrick, I see you've raised your hand. Thank you, Ben. I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with Mary's position on this, that we um, bring it to convention. For the reasons that she's articulated, and I would add to it as well, that um, I think it, it helps us to open the conversation to all the congregations about what um, Indigenous peoples lived on the land that our congregations currently occupy, um, learning their history, learning what engagements um, we had with those tribes and just any any conversation we can have as a convention to, to keep in front of us racism, um, anti-racist efforts and um, harm that's been done to uh, marginalized communities is really, really helpful in keeping that conversation going forward. And if we, if we don't do that as an individual convention or as a diocese, um, it, what's gonna happen at general convention is so focused on on uh, other issues of indigenous peoples versus what potentially is going on in our own diocese. So I would encourage the resolution to go forward and, and keep the conversation and that, that discussion open. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Any further comments or questions? Um, I just wanna note for everybody here that all three of the resolutions uh, came in after the formal resolution submission deadline. Um, and as such, they me it means that all of these are technically being proposed from the floor. Um, and so uh, just a reminder that we will have two votes on each resolution. Uh, one is uh, a vote to even authorize the convention to talk about it, uh, and then a vote um, to approve it. Um, and so uh, I, I just note that to say that um, the resolution that we're discussing right now actually is in sort of a uh, strange parliamentary place where it has not actually formally been submitted. We just know about it and so that we can talk about it. Thank you, Brennan. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any more comments to be made. If anybody has anything else to uh, say? Going once, going twice. All right, um, Rocky, I'll just note, um, as uh, as Mary and Patrick were speaking, I saw some heads nodding in the chat as I was scanning for raised hands. So I think there's, um, you've got some agreement, at least at this, um, at this hearing, that it might be worth pursuing. With that, uh, let's move to the second resolution relating to the Avenue Foundation. And I believe this resolution comes from St. Paul's and I think, Patrick, this is your resolution, correct? Thank you, Father Ben. Um, so before you is a resolution to add the Avenue Foundation as a cooperating ministry with the Diocese of Indianapolis. And the Avenue Foundation is a brand new foundation that's being incubated through work with St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Indianapolis. And uh, you will see both a public foundation that um, focuses primarily on providing grants and economic resources to incubate um, and expand uh, very small existing Black-owned businesses within Indianapolis. Um, it, the Avenue Foundation will also operate a coffee shop at the intersection of Broad Ripple and College Avenues right on the red line, uh, which will help to support the foundation. Um, but this is a new foundation that is being incubated. Um, it, is, it is now an incorporated nonprofit entity and in the process of putting together its board and um, uh, all the, the articles are there, but the, the actual um, uh, 
structure of the foundation is in the process of being incubated as well. So it is a brand new entity, but its primary focus is going to be um, economic, um, uh, racial equity and economic justice through community redevelopment. Um, but it will be um, aligned with our mission pillar of standing with the vulnerable and the most marginalized in our community so that we can um, assist economically in that redevelopment within Indianapolis. So that's a little bit about the, the Avenue Foundation. And it's uh, and so it, it will operate in this coffee shop um, in Broad Ripple. St. Paul's on the Way will be part of that, along with Liberation Church, which will be the primary gathered uh, faith community, which is a community that um, predominantly is made up of LGBTQ members of the Black community. That is the resolution on the Avenue Foundation. Thank you, Patrick. Any questions, points of clarification, comments? Davies, I see your hand raised. Thanks. Uh, and we discussed this at length at Executive Council. Uh, because they'd become a cooperating ministry, uh, it would require a very slight change to the budget. But I don't think we have any question that we're going to be able to manage that. So the budget implications are also uh, come with the support of the budget formation committee. Thank you. Oh, I see uh, Mary Slinsky, you're recognized. Thank you, just, I'm wondering, I when I read this in advance, uh, I was curious exact who, what is their congregation supporting it? And I'm wondering, since this has not been officially brought to the convention yet, if somewhere it could add that this is a link with St. Paul's Indianapolis. Otherwise, it looks like it's coming out of nowhere. <laughs> That's all. I'm just an edit to the resolution. Uh, Patrick, if you would be willing to send me a little bit of suggested text, I'd be happy to add that, that to the explanation. Absolutely. No problem. I think it's a great suggestion. Patrick, I um, just have a quick question. For those of us who are new to the diocese or may not be as, um, as familiar with some of our um, mechanics, uh, you know, you, you say that we designate the Avenue Foundation to be a cooperating ministry with all the privileges and obligations that such designation accords. Can you say just a few words about what uh, being a cooperating ministry entails? Uh, I can speak to what I know, and I would encourage if there's anything I'm missing for Brendan or Davies who have uh, more experience with this than I do, but mm -hmm. um, there are several cooperating ministries with the diocese. If you think of Exodus, uh, Refugee, or Damien Center um, are two of the larger ones, but essentially they, um, they are organizations where our mission and values align, and they are able to um, purchase into the diocesan um, benefits program through CPG. Um, there is a, um, because of IRS rules, there's a small um, uh, financial contribution from the diocese as well. Um, but there are organizations that um, have access to various pieces administratively within the diocese um, that we do as congregations. Is that a succinct, uh, Brendan, way of commenting on that? Uh, I think it is. Uh, the other thing I'd add is because sometimes um, people get tripped up on the ministry term and its uh, religious implications. Uh, obviously, we view our affiliation with these organizations as an extension of our ministry, uh, but it should be known that all of these are independent 501c3 organizations uh, that are not under the control of the church uh, in any way. Uh, other than that we have an institutional affiliation that allows them uh, to access our employee benefits. Um, so um, so it, we, we don't control them. Um, we do require them to submit an audit to us each year uh, so that uh, we verify that um, the organizations that we're working with uh, are, um, are, doing, are, are following sound business practices, uh, but otherwise exert no control. Thank you. Valeria, I see that your hand is up. Uh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you. Um, just um, 
a matter of clarification that might come up in some discussions on this. I know that uh, legal names are very important and I understand that the name of this is the Avenue Foundation. Uh, just want it to be clear that that is College Avenue, not to be confused with the Avenue, Indiana Avenue. So just um, when I first uh, saw the name, I was thinking Indiana Avenue but I do realize that it is College Avenue. So just a point to be aware in discussion about that. Thank you, Valeria. Any further discussion? Okay, Mary Slensky notes in chat that she made the same association. I'm mostly saying that out loud, so it's picked up by the transcript. And Ben, can I add a point of clarification on that? Yes, absolutely. I will be honest that the um, the founder of the Avenue Foundation does have Indiana Avenue as the background for the the mission and the vision of the foundation. And in fact, the coffee shop will have an Indiana Avenue theme to it. So Indiana Avenue is at the heart of where the foundation is pulling um, its mission from. So just to be clear about that, though the location is College and Prado Ripple Avenue. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Would anyone else like to speak to this? Going once, going twice. All right, I think we are ready to move on um, to the St. Nicholas resolution. And I believe Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale will be speaking to this. So Brendan, you're recognized to speak. Thank you. Uh, so this resolution, similar to the one we just discussed, is to uh, recognize uh, another organization as a cooperating ministry, this one, St. Nicholas Early Learning, uh, which is a daycare center that was originated uh, with uh, Trinity Episcopal Church in Indianapolis. Um, it is now an independent organization, <clears throat> but still provides programming uh, on the Trinity campus uh, in the Trinity uh, Outreach Center. Uh, it's specifically structured to uh, serve a um, diverse population, both uh, racially and economically. Um, and they requested to become a cooperating ministry because, uh, as any of you have been following uh, the news lately, uh, daycare is a real challenge right now. I and mean, it's always a challenge, but it's really a challenge now. Uh, and so the um, so both as a matter of justice and as a matter of being able to compete in the marketplace for um, for talented employees, uh, St. Nicholas Early Learning has uh, perceived a need to offer um, health insurance benefits to their staff, which they previously have not done. Um, so um, they approached us uh, to be able to um, offer uh, offer these benefits, um, and uh, they presented to Executive Council uh, in September, and Executive Council agreed uh, that um, that we it would be desirable for the Diocese of Indianapolis to affiliate to affiliate with St. Nicholas Early Learning, and uh, happy to take any questions on that. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, the floor is open for discussion, points of clarification. Uh, Mary Slensky, I see that your hand is raised. Thank you. One more point of clarification on cooperating ministries. Uh, C. Davies, I think you alluded to this, that the link between these uh, 501c3s and the diocese does include an expectation that there will be some financial link also. Yeah, I think you mentioned about having it in the, there has to be something in the diocesan budget that we also have an economic link. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, I was going to jump in and say the same thing applies to this resolution as to the last. So th the deal is that uh, the diocesan budget supports each of the cooperating ministries to the tune of $1,000 a year, which creates the financial link. And that uh, we believe uh, helps the IRS understand that they do have an authentic um, relationship with the diocese such that they can uh, they can access the employee benefits, which is the real benefit to being a cooperating ministry is being able to be a part of the 
uh, pension plan and also the health health care plan. Um, so each of the cooperating ministries gets a thousand uh, dollars, which is in the budget. And and ex at executive council, we uh, Brennan and I looked at it all and said, yeah, we think we can find two thousand dollars to make these um, resolutions funded or to fund these resolutions. That would have been a sentence if I had more time to think about it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mary Ann C. Davies. Any other questions, comments, points of clarification? All right, I'm not seeing any other hands raised in the chat or anybody raising hands in their images. So uh, we'll close the floor for discussion in three, two, sold and um i believe that concludes the resolutions portion of our business so back over to you brendan hey thank you father ben and thank you for uh agreeing to chair the resolutions committee uh this year um, i hope it has not been too onerous a task um so the next item to present is uh the res um a an update to the canons, bear with me a sec. Okay, so this is a uh, resolution that comes from standing committee and I'm uh, presenting it uh, on their uh, behalf. And what this is, is a resolution to Canon 7, Section 4, uh, which addresses how the diocese um, calculates its apportionment. Um, so what uh, what the canon currently requires uh, is that the apportionment be based on an average of the uh, prior uh, three years of normal operating income as um, uh, as as reported on the parochial report. So executive council has within its purview the ability to change the percentage basis from year to year, but they cannot change uh, the underlying number. Uh, that is the normal operating income. Uh, so the guidance that uh, we received um, and everybody received uh, from the Episcopal Church Center regarding the parochial report and the PPP loans was that when the loans are forgiven, uh, they are to be included as income uh, on the normal operating income line of the parochial report. Uh, so Standing Committee and Executive Council have both discussed this, and the spirit of the way we calculate our, um, our apportionment uh, by calculating it over a three-year period uh, is to be able to adjust to structural changes in a congregation's income, whether that's income that is moving up or income that is moving down. Uh, income such as the PPP loan, which is an emergency relief program, uh, does not seem to fit that spirit um, of a structural change in congregational income. Uh, so this resolution or this uh, amendment to the canon permits executive council to deduct um, items from normal operating income at its discretion. Uh, the text does, does not address PPP loans directly uh, because uh, we wanted the language to be to address not only this situation, but also potential future situations. Um, passage of this canon amendment uh, is essential in order for us to be able to pass the budget uh, because the budget assumes uh, that this amendment uh, will indeed pass. Uh, and if, uh, if it does not, in fact, pass, we can still go ahead and, uh, and do the budget. Uh, just know that if your congregation received a PPP loan, uh, that uh, your apportionment will be going up. Uh, so, uh, and that may not be the outcome you desire. Brennan, on a on a sidetrack, uh, does the diocese get to deduct their PPP loan from the apportionment we pay to the Episcopal Church? 
Uh, we do not. Uh, Executive Council discussed that um, sometime over the summer, if I remember. Exec the Executive Council of the Episcopal Church is a denomination, not the Diocesan Executive Council. Uh, did have a conversation with that sometime earlier uh, this year, and they determined that it would not be um, uh, that it would not be exempted. Uh, what they did as sort of a consolation prize uh, is that uh, they provided for uh, a grant of forty thousand dollars to any diocese uh, who asks for it, uh, provided that every diocese says what it is that uh, what what it is that they intend to do with the money. Uh, based on the size of our PPP loan, um, we actually come out a little bit ahead um, of um, under that grant program. Uh, our loan was about $200,000, $200,000 times 15% is $30,000, and we're getting $40,000 back instead. So it works out okay for us. Uh, that $40,000 grant um, will be used uh, to amplify uh, the Congregational Grants Program introduced in the 2022 budget. And here, I thought you're going to put it into office supplies. <laughs> I am not seeing any other questions or comments. So with that, uh, C. Davies, I will turn it over to you to talk about the budget. Um, I am prepared to share my screen, but considering how small that print is, um, I'm just going to share a link to it in the chat, and then I can share my screen if questions seem to warrant it. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Bryn. Uh, I hope that everyone has seen the budget presentation, and if you want to see a copy of the budget, that you've had the opportunity to do that and to comb through it uh, to your heart's extent. Um, I, I don't want to regurgitate the, the whole presentation that most of, I'm sure you've already heard. Uh, so I'd like to just open it for questions and maybe make a point or two, and then um, and then we could wrap up. Are, are there pressing issues or questions or clarifications that would be helpful to folks here on this call? Okay. Just a reminder that uh, our healthcare costs came in under what we had originally projected, which is always good news. Uh, particularly for a line item that is so important to so many of us um, that we get such a fabulous health care plan in this diocese, which is not something that other dioceses offer. Mary Slinsky, hand in the corner. And I'm going to pass. I'm going to wait till convention. There's something I say every year that I really appreciate in the budget, and I'll do it for a larger, larger audience. Uh, next week. <laughs> That makes us feel sort of chintzy, Mary. <laughs> okay, I'll say that. Uh, I commend the budget committee on continuing to put into the budget basically like a sinking fund to pay for the transition for whenever we, uh, for when Bishop Jennifer decides to retire and commend mm. that same practice to any congregation. Although the, you know, there, here's where my interim and transition experience comes in, especially the process costs are dropping way down because of Zoom. It tends to be moving expenses that are a driver and for congregations to have that discipline looking to their future is good stewardship. I'm not sure you can say that enough, Mary, in enough different places. You're absolutely okay, right. I'll keep doing it. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> keep that message coming. Keep that message coming. Um, yeah, moving costs can top 30 grand. Whew, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. All right. Well, with that, uh, in the books and, uh, seeing no more hands, I'll just say, uh, today's the Monon Bell game between Wabash and DePauw and, uh, may the best team win, particularly the team in red and white. Thank you, C. Davies. And thank you all. Um, Having no Wabash nor DePaul connections, I have no dog in that fight. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all at convention, uh, whether in person uh, or online. Uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you all.